Good evening, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us this evening for a, um, an evening of short films made by Native American filmmakers in honor of the third annual Indigenous Peoples Day in Los Angeles, although um, the Indigenous Peoples Day has been celebrated across uh, the United States for many more years. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge that uh, uh, we are officially beginning a partnership with the fantastic LA Skins Fest that takes place here in Los Angeles. Um, and we'll be doing a series of events throughout the fall semester, including um, another shorts lineup next week. We'll make an announcement very soon that are going to feature five short documentary films. Um, but tonight's showcase are four scripted short films uh, presented by Outside the Box Office. Um, Our Voices, which is the speaking series um, as part of our Council for Diversity and Inclusion, as well as USC Visions and Voices, the USC Arts uh, and Humanities Initiative, and the 14th annual LA Skins Fest. Um, I'm very excited to have one of our MFA um, producing candidates, Capena Baptista, who's going to be the moderator for the evening. Uh, we're going to play all of four of the shorts back to back. Um, it's going to run just under an hour, and uh, we'll run it directly through the webinar. Um, I apologize in advance if any of it comes off as um, slightly clunky, clunky in between the films, because I have to sort of shut one down and start the others, so just bear with me. Um, and then when we get to the question and answer portion of the evening, um, we're going to ask that you place your questions in the Q&A box um, at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. And then we'll call on you individually and welcome you over one by one to ask your questions live. So if you'd like at that point, we'll bring you on as a panelist, you can turn on your video. And if you don't wanna turn on your video, you're welcome to just use your microphone, but it would be really great to, to see and hear you live. Uh, and I know all of our filmmakers and Kapena and I would really love uh, to see who's, who's out there watching tonight. Um, so I'd like to now welcome on my colleague, Stacy Patterson, uh, who will offer us a land acknowledgement. Hi. Good evening, everybody. My name is Stacey Patterson. My pronouns are she, her. And I'm a proud daughter of an enrolled member of the Ojibwe Nation of White Earth, Minnesota. I also serve as a program manager in our Division of Media Arts and Practice here in the school, USC School of Cinematic Arts. I join the organizers of tonight's event to welcome you and to ask that you join me to acknowledge the land on which we work, teach, study, create, and build community. For those of us in the LA Basin, this is Tongva land. For those of you who may be coming and connecting with us from somewhere else, I encourage you to visit nativeland.ca which affords the opportunity for you to discover the original people, if you are not one of them yourself, of your home. Beginning some 3,500 years ago, the Tongva moved into coastal Southern California, inhabiting what is now Los Angeles and beyond. They thrived near their four sacred mountains and their four sacred rivers, including what was the wild and free LA River. They developed trade routes and outposts that became places like downtown Los Angeles. When the Spanish began to settle uh, in the area and colonize in the 1600s, conflict was inevitable. Violence, disease, and ultimately forced relocation, a policy the US government would take up as well, profoundly altered the lives of indigenous people but that is not the end of the story. Honoring those who came before us isn't only about the past or about history, and it certainly isn't about demise. It is hope and resilience and the transfer of knowledge that continues across generations and native communities today. It is a call for all of us to expand our understanding of indigenous people, to understand that Tongva, like many native peoples everywhere, continue in the present, they strive for self-determination and demand respect for tribal sovereignty and the honoring of long-standing treaties. Like any of us, modern Native people love stories of all genres, across all mediums. So as we acknowledge Tongva land, I ask that we, Native or not, through the stories we develop, the research we conduct, 
the courses we teach, that we imagine and create a present and a future that is perhaps at least a bit less colonized, a bit more indigenized. And I hope that you will attend programming like tonight's, not only on Indigenous Peoples Day or during November's Native American History Month, but whenever and wherever it is offered. And I thank you for your time and for being here. Thank you so much, Stacey. Um, I'd like to welcome Ian Scoridan from the uh, LA Skins Fest to tell you all a little bit more about uh, what's coming up at their festival. Yeah, thank you, Alex. And Stacy. thank you for that. That was beautiful. I really appreciate that. Um, yes, well, the LA Skins Fest is our 14th year of our film festival. And uh, the LA Skins Fest has a year-round programming that has um, a TV writer's lab, a feature film writer's lab, an animation lab, and this year we launched a Native American showrunner program. So we're always looking to um, advance the, the voice of Native America in uh, film and television and media in general. And uh, we're just really excited to be a part of this. Our film festival this year is November 17th through the 22nd. Um, and we are still working on uh, getting all the details um, assigned for that for this year, but it's looking great as always. Um, and I just wanna say thank you again to USC's uh, School of Cinematic Arts, the USC Vision and Voices program. And of course, Alex, I really appreciate uh, all the effort you've done in putting this together and partnering with us. Um, it's, it's an honor for us, really, thank you. It's very exciting to see all of the filmmakers that you pulled together and, uh, and the fact that we're gonna be able to keep doing this on an ongoing basis, it's really, um, uh, I think, a, a wonderful way for us, at the very least, to get, um, you know, filmmakers to speak with our students who, you know, we might not get a chance to interact with, um, just based on, you know, uh, having to get down to USC and, you know, especially when people aren't local. So, uh, this is us really finding a nice way to make Zoom work in our favor. Um, and uh, of course, I'd love to, to show these films on the big screen. But uh, as we're all here at home, uh, this is about as, as good as it's going to get. Um, and considering that we are able to bring people together with a certain amount of intimacy, despite the virtual nature of it, I think that it's really fantastic uh, that we're able to do this both mm -hmm. tonight, next week, in November, and beyond. So thank you so much. Um, let me now welcome up uh, Kapena, who will uh, introduce the films, and then we'll get going. Oh, we na ali e o ke aui hala e na na mai a ma ko na pula pula ne a we holo ne e yala mai ka ko e na kini na mamo ka aina aloha aloha vale i a aina ko ka ko ka hua a we ka ili di e ho we hui a ne e pai pai ho i a ka po haku i pa mai la ke ko hua hale ho no ka ko e na e na po e ho unuai it's such a honor just to be here right now with everyone. And there are over 200 of you inside this seminar. And it's kind of overwhelming to see all these people here with these amazing filmmakers. And I'm just, I'm, I'm just in awe of everything that we brought here today, despite everything that's happening in the world. And it's like Stacy said, you know, I really hope you all gain so much out of this program and really take what you learn inside this program and in, in, into, into other places and continue to consume some kind of native content um, beyond what today is. And today we have such a special treat for you all. We got four amazing films lined up for you from four amazing filmmakers um, from, all, from all over, from Alaska to Hawaii to California and Colorado. Um, Don Avery uh, directed Gently Jennifer, who we'll watch first, followed by Duke, which is by Michelle Hernandez, followed by Escape, which was directed by the youth of the Ute Mountain Youth Tribe, uh, the Youth Mountain Ute, Youth, the Ute Mountain Youth Tribe, and we have the producer um, Beverly Santicola and Kamea Clark here uh, to speak to that. And finally, we'll end with Bryson Chun's Capico. Um, the film program will run for about an hour, um, and we will return after for a moderated Q and A. So I hope you enjoy. Hello again. Welcome back. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let Kapena take it away, but uh, thank you all so much. 
and uh, enjoy the Q&A. And when it comes time to open it up to the audience, just make sure to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll call on you one-on-one. -on -one. Wow, that was such an amazing program of films. Like I, that was absolutely incredible. A big round of applause to you all. Um, if yeah, if you all could turn on your cameras, um, so I so I could see y'all, that'd be great. Ah, perfect. Look at that, amazing. Um, congratulations to all of you for such wonderful works of art. Um, and I really wanted to give you all the opportunity before we really delve in, in, into each film, uh, just a moment to introduce yourself um, and how you each came into filmmaking. And as an, ad, as an added bonus, if you want, um, maybe tell us a little bit about how your culture and community um, informs your filmmaking art. Uh, so we will start uh, in order, let's go with uh, Don. Hey, um, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so my name's Doan and I uh, actually went to Cal Arts for film directing and got my MFA from there. Um, came out of that program a few years ago and have been working in film production since. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's funny when people ask like, how does your culture inform you? It's just like, it's a part of who you are as a person. And so obviously that, you know, it, it affects everything that I do. Mm -hmm. um, to what degree that might be varies. Mm -hmm. um, and depending on like the scope of the project, you know, that it, it just kind of, uh, yeah, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what made you decide to go into filmmaking? Um, you know, like from a very young age, I started to write, stories um mm. and like song lyrics actually too <laughs> i'm not a musician but um i was just like really into writing from a really mm. young age and um into visual storytelling i actually went um to the institute of american indian arts to get my undergrad wow it was gonna be a double major in photography and in museum studies and then kind of came out of that um going more in the direction of uh museum studies and went into like nonprofit arts. Um, you know, that career path lasted for a short while. And then I was a residency director for an artist um, and writer's residency program, which that really started to fuel my desire to actually, you know, kind of form my own voice as an artist myself and um, took a few classes just in Santa Fe where I was living at the time, um, just to, you know, feel it out. Like, is this something I, I feel like I could really do? Do I want to mm -hmm. abandon my career path that, you know, was growing in like the nonprofit arts world? Mm. And um, I went for it. So I came out to LA seven years ago to, you know, do the master's program at CalArts and haven't looked back. Amazing, congratulations. Uh, moving on to Michelle. Uh, technology. <laughs> um, so I'm Michelle. I'm Wea. I'm from Northern California. I grew up on a small reservation in Table Bluff. And then um, I went to school there for film and Native American studies and then went to American University and got my master's in film and electronic media. And then um, I came to LA and started making stuff and haven't, you know, decided that I want to leave. I'm still here. Um, but what were all your questions? There's a couple. Yeah, yeah. How 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 does your community and culture inform your filmmaking art? Yeah. Um. So, growing up on the reservation and watching films, I never really saw us, and so mm -hmm. and I also didn't see. I'm a Northern Californian native, and so mm -hmm. every native that I saw on the screen was Westernized, mm -hmm. or um, you know, the typical stereotypical native, and mm -hmm. I got tired of seeing that. Mm -hmm. Like, I want to see me, I want to see my siblings, right. see my cousins on the screen, and right. I want to tell my stories. And we're very different from other natives, and other tribes are very different from one another. And so that's kind of what influences me. And so I always want to incorporate like my identity and who I am into my stories. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, Beverly and also Kamea, who's also here joining us. Welcome. 
I, well, I'm just the grant writer, so I, I got the money for the for the film. That was <laughs> that was my role, but um, the uh, leading actress is Camille, so I'll let her take over. Hey, I'm Camille Clark. Uh, I got involved with filming through posters in Toyot. It was kind of the talk of the town. I live in Toyot, Colorado, uh -huh. and. Uh, I decided to join because I'm very passionate about writing, mm. just any sorts of stories. And I was pretty nervous at first, but it was actually a lot of fun. I've never really looked into filmmaking before, and I, I definitely enjoy it. Um, Sorry, what were your other questions? Yeah, I mean, so how do you, how, how, how does your culture and community inform your craft or your art? Um. I feel like our community kind of informs it through the film in a way because it's like community issues. Mm. Um, and a lot of the stories were based off Toyok. Mm. Um, every single issue we brought to light because it's just not something that's really talked about. Right. And I kind of feel like that's wrong in a way because it should be a discussion, right. not something you push off. Right. Um, and I think the, the community really supported the film because mm. we had a lot of good reaction towards it. Mm. We'll, we'll, we'll get into it in a little bit. I have a lot of questions about the film, but amazing job. Thank, thank you for joining us. Thank you. And uh, Bryson? Yeah, um, I, I went to film school in Hawaii for, for a minute or two. Uh -huh. um, at the at the University of Hawaii and they have a great um, program there and um, what was really cool about that is they really embraced not just making good films but making good films that had a sense of place and mm -hmm. because we're telling it you know from Hawaii and a lot mm -hmm. of us are Hawaiian filmmakers it was mm -hmm. really um, trying to bring that part of you into your your creative work um, and then beyond that, I think Hawaii has a, I, I've been saying it for so long in, in panels like this, that Hawaii has a, a burgeoning film community, but I yeah. think that's a lie. I think we've arrived. And <laughs> I think, um, <laughs> I think it's, it's, you know, I, I don't want to, there are so many people who paved the way for me mm. and um, they're still making films and um, they're, they're all over the place. Um, one mm. of my, one of my good friends is a uh, has a film going around now that uh, won at Imaginative last year, and it, it played at um, Skins and won at Skins. And so, you know, I think we're um, we're a little bit behind, but we're we're catching up. So, I think it's that sense of community that we all know each other and support each other, and there's no um, animosity that you see often in in film. I think it's a more collaborative environment mm. here. Mm. That's beautiful. I mean, I always love to hear stories about communities lifting each other up, right? And I think it's really important for us to, to do that, especially since we're already so underrepresented um, and marginalized in, in, in a slew of different ways. So it's always really beautiful to see that happening. Um, so I, I wanted to go in and kind of briefly ask each one of you kind of more specific questions as they, as they pertain to, to, to each sort. So um, Don, I, I really want to talk to you about Gen Gently Jennifer. Um, so much happened in such a short period of time. I mean, it, it turned out that it was kind of like this normal scene in a bedroom and then suddenly this, this surrealist falling into the magazine part. Could, could you tell me about um, the idea of the story, where it, where it came from and what the development process was like? Yeah, it actually came out of, um, I had done a workshop with um, the filmmaker Jennifer Reeder mm. my last year at CalArts and um, started, uh, it came out with like a short script through that workshop and then kind of sat on it and was kind of putting attention to some other stuff. And then, uh, you know, I really want to make a film. So, you know, as a writer, it's easy to just keep building content in terms of like, you know, I can write another script, I can write another script. And, you know, I want to keep doing that, but I really wanted to make a film. And, um, you know, the, the process of it, you know, we didn't have a lot of resources or money, but, you know, through people that I went to school with or that, 
you know, I was working with in production, we kind of had a team of people that were just on board for doing this thing. Uh, and, you know, for no money. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I like um, that sometimes, right. Yeah, so it was, you know, a fun collaborative process as filmmaking is, but like people really jumped on mm. um, to be a part of it, which is great. Um, so that's, you know, that's where it started. And it just, uh, I wanted to make something different from what I had done. Uh -huh. Um, and so like, I don't consider myself like a comedy writer so much, but I, I wanted to have like more kind of comedic mm. tone, um, fun. I always kind of incorporate some kind of like, um, either surreal element or especially with like a musical element into stuff that I write um, that happens yeah. a lot. And so I, I just love working in that kind of space. Um, yeah. It's, yeah. So, I mean, I talk about a, a music choice, right? I mean, the, the safety dance was a great, was a great choice. I mean, talk a little bit about this kind of 80s aesthetic that was happening throughout the film. I mean, yeah. um, I feel like late, lately I'm seeing a lot of 80s themed things, even from my classmates who are like pitching kind of 80s themed projects. Yeah. Uh, do you have like a particular like penchant for the 80s or where's where that coming no, from? No, I, it's, I am just a product of, like I'm, <laughs> um, I grew up uh, in the 80s, 90s, um, but I, you know, just grew up like watching like a lot of like John Hughes stuff, like, you know, that was constantly like playing mm -hmm. on TV or, you know, just all the music videos and, you know, talk about like lack of representation and, you know, homophobia and racism and, you know, these things that are, they're kind of a constant in all of those movies right and, and even music videos right. um it's sad but so then i just uh that was the idea it's just like okay if i could like insert a different voice into that kind of narrative that i grew up watching but like just twist it you know like right but if i were <laughs> john hughes i you know have a lot yeah. more money but i would like um yeah like what would how would my voice like add to that or mm, mm. i mean we we love a queer film like we we love it <laughs> so like, i mean then you talked about kind of like a lack of representation so can you talk a little bit about why queer representation specifically like queer native women representation is is so so important to see yeah well i mean you know as kind of michelle kind of um was talking to the point like just growing up i did not see myself at all Mm. Um, as a native person, as a queer person, yeah, just, you know, it was just lacking. Mm. Right? Um, so, and, you know, in terms of like, you know, you asking like, how does my culture inform mm. what I do? Like, that's also a part of me. And so, mm. it, you know, um, if you want to bring, you know, any kind of like honesty to something, you, you want to lend something of yourself, you know, and mm -hmm. find that vulnerable place um so uh, you know it's important to me because that's that's who i am <laughs> right 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 so what's next for the film what's that what what's next for the film are you are, are do you do you have screenings oh. coming up for it or where, um, where are you taking it i don't um it played at la skins um mm -hmm. last year mm -hmm. um and it, you know it played um a handful of festivals um, wow. last year, but I haven't really put it into the festival circuit. I've kind of been busy with other stuff and just right. kind of stepped away from mm. pushing that more. But well, looking forward to future projects from you. Yeah, thanks. Excited, thank you. Um, so mo moving on to to Duke with uh, Michelle. I mean, thank you so much for this film. I, I think it was it was just so powerful in so many ways. I mean, so so little I think is known about the boarding school experience and what was done to a lot of our, our relatives throughout Indian country. Um, so can you speak a little bit about like why talking about this is so important and why having this conversation at the levels we need to be having this conversation at is so difficult? Yeah, um, well, exactly your point. Not many people know this history. And mm -hmm. so 
the project came about because I was in grad school and I had to figure out a thesis. Mm. And for me, I had been told these stories growing up. It's not a secret in our community. It's something we talk about. Mm. And so I was so used to talking about it when I would tell other people about these stories. No one knew, especially in D.C., which is like where, you know, government and things are happening. They know. They just don't talk about it. Right. Um, uh, people outside of that don't know. They don't have any idea. And so I'd constantly pitch this project and be like, do you know about the native boarding school experience? And everyone would be like, no. So then I had to go into a history lesson. Right. Um, and I chose to do a narrative because I've tried to do docs and it's just not my thing. Um, mm. I also watched many docs on this subject. And the one thing I didn't really see, I always see of the experience at the school but we really don't talk about how families dealt with it and mm -hmm. how, um, like, what they did, how they felt. And I wanted to make my family very human. And I feel like we're not seen as human often um, mm -hmm. or that we're these stoic people. And I wanted to tell the story of a family, you know, having their children taken. So that's kind of why I went into that direction. I also wanted to make it a short um, so that educators had something to show at the beginning of class and then they could go and have a lesson um, because right now bite-sized media is a thing and so that's why I made it 15 minutes so that you could show it and teach um, but yeah that's how the project came about was just the lack of knowledge from other people around and so I made it um, Wanda was based off of my great grandma. Even though it's a fictional film, these are women that I've had in my life mm -hmm. um, that experienced these things. So my grandma Wanda is why Wanda was named that. And then Irene was another elder that I had in my life who mm -hmm. was strong and there are these strong female characters. And that's something else I don't see, strong female characters. Um, so that's why this project came about. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you you talked a little bit about like your own kind of personal experiences, you know, uh, having having kind of like a cultural legacy of the boarding school, right? And I think it's so interesting because so I'm I'm born and raised in Southern California, and I believe it's a fourth or fifth grade where we learn about um, California Native history, right? And I think that's often told through the lens of the mission system, mm -hmm. um, and and even still, it's like. It, it's often portraying the missions as this kind of like benevolent civil, civilizing force where, you know, institutions like the boarding school become kind of necessary, right, for kind of civilizing the Indian, so, so to speak. So I think it's really interesting that, that this film is, is, is kind of meant to be used as an educational tool. Um, and I think that that could only be really beneficial. Um, so like, do, do, you think, do you think people are becoming more and more open to having this kind of conversation? I think so. Um, I've shown this in a couple places and a couple panels um, and a lot of people are very open to learning. I think a lot of shock comes from it. Yeah. A lot of people don't know that this happened. Right. And so um, I think people are very open to conversation. And so they're just like, why aren't we talking about this more? And I'm like, because I need you guys as allies to bring it up and then, you know, bring us on to right. teach. Me. Right. And so that's kind of, what I've seen, there's been an acceptance of this film and there's been an acceptance of learning about this history and not hiding right. it away. Right. I mean, I, I, I just found the images of um, you know, the women being taken, right? And I think that that kind of speaks volumes to the current crisis that we have right now in terms of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Could, could you speak to that a little bit more and how that experience might inform this film? So um, when I wrote this film, I wasn't really thinking about murder and, and mm. I'm going to, I am so awkward. Mm. I'm going to be normal. Um, mm. But I wasn't thinking about that in terms. I was more thinking about um, these young girls because I put my sister. So the girl who plays Irene is my little sister, actually. And so I made her at that age of 14 mm. because that's when we become women. That's when we get our moons. Mm. Um, so for me... I wanted to show this young girl who is not only leaving childhood, mm. but becoming a woman. And not only, you know, is she dealing with this issue of becoming this woman, but now she has to deal with the issue of trying to protect her sibling. Mm. 
Um, but the, yes, I think that's a huge theme that we need to talk about. I think it's, you know, murder and missing indigenous women is the thing that is coming up. Mm. And I think we need to discuss it more. It's just, it's been so, it's been happening for so long and we don't talk about these things. And these all, things also stem from when colonization began. Right, right. All the history of native women and all the things that have happened to them and it just continually happens and we just need it to stop and we need people to speak up for us and we need people to stop ignoring that these things are happening and stop ignoring us. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that. Um, kind of, kind of on, on, on a different topic, the, what beautiful land this was shot on. I mean, it, it was so, it was so gorgeous just to see kind of your, 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 your set there. What was that shot on your, on, on, on your homeland or? So that was shot on Yurok land. Yuroks are wow. our neighboring tribe. Um, I grew up with tons of Yurok friends. Also, wow. I um, got to dance. Our ceremonies are very similar from each other, but unfortunately at the time of growing up, we didn't practice um, our dances as we ought people. We would join other tribes. And so they accepted me growing up. And so I got to do these ceremonies. Um, I grew up in that area. Mm-hmm. And so, I knew where I wanted to film Duke, which was in our local area. I wanted it to have our traditional homes, which you saw our traditional homes are there. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a process of getting that land. Um, Um, That was, I think, out of all the things I asked for, because I asked for a lot for this movie, that's kind of how it got made. That was the one nerve wracking thing that I had to do. I had to talk to a bunch of elders. So it all started with a conversation with my mentor and I was like, hey, I have a short film. I really want to shoot it in Sumeg. Um, you think your grandma and Walt and other elders, you know, might let me? And she's like, well, you know, they're preparing for ceremony. They're over at Sumeg right now. Let's go hop in a car and talk to them. And I was like, oh, I thought this was going to be a, you talking to them and then just letting me know. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So she's like, no. She's like, you know how I am. We, we're going over there. So we mm. went and... Um, and at that time, we had an emergency meeting with one of the producers, and that's why we were back home, because we thought we were going to shoot the movie earlier than when we actually planned it. So we went, we talked to them. I remember like being terrified, even though I've known these people my entire life. Mm-hmm. I was terrified, right. and there was silence after I had pitched the project, and I was just like, oh my God, they're going to say no. I don't know why I thought they were going to say no, but in my head, I'm just like, they're going to say no. And Walt, who he's just the most cheerful man I've ever met and he's just like a big teddy bear he opened his mouth and he's like yeah you can shoot in that house and then he started having his ideas of like what scenes need to be in the movies and what locations and I remember his daughter was like dad this is Michelle's movie just you know she's got to do what she's got to do but yeah so that's how we ended up with Sumig shooting there I think besides the tribe we've been the only people allowed to shoot on the village other places in the park. It was also in a park. So Sumig is within a national state park. Um, it's Patrick's Point. So everything in that movie was shot in Patrick's Point. So we just, all we had to do is drive to the different locations. Mm-hmm. But we, I don't, I don't know how they gave us access, but we got access to it. And they gave us a really cheap permit. I don't know. I call Duke my little miracle movie because we got all sorts of miracles and got this movie made on an invisible budget. So... <laughs> Right, right. Um, But yeah, that's how we shot it. And I really wanted to shoot it in near where I grew up because I wanted the people to see the beauty of our lands Mm. and to also understand that our lands aren't just a place, but they're a being. Mm. And I wanted to also capture that in Duke, which I hope kind of happened. But I just wanted to tell people, like, like, this is another person in this film, a silent person. Wow, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much for for making this. I mean, what what a miracle it is for us to be able to see it. Thank you. Um, kind of have to move move on a little bit because I, I think uh, I I want to leave enough room for for the Q and A. So, um, moving on to Beverly and Kamiya and Escape. Um, this film really hit me. I I it's just so real and so honest about so many of the issues that exist on reservation communities today. And I understand this was done in conjunction with the youth of, of, of the tribe. So I guess uh, for Beverly, could you tell us a little bit more about how you came into this project and um, maybe a little bit more about how the film was developed? 
Uh, well, I write grants for the tribe, and we had a um, we had a grant that we needed to start an after school program with, and so. Um, I was thinking uh, I'm the creative one when it comes to writing grant proposals. And I was thinking that the youth needed a voice. They needed to learn how to advocate for their people. Mm. And that film might be the coolest way to, mm. to get that done. So, um, so always in my mind, it's been growing growing the youth in leadership and communication skills so they can advocate for their people. Um, this year, um, this year we, we just won a $4.7 million grant, which I'm wow. so excited about. Congratulations. It's for, um, it's for an after school program and we have organized the team. Ian actually helped with that uh, over the last two to three weeks. But um, anyway, uh, we have an after school program that will be year round. Filmmaking will be a big part of it. And um, I think they called it the Youth Mountain Youth Tribe Arts and Film Institute. So, um, so they'll be, uh, so they'll be doing more film projects, but they did one on um, uh, meth as well. Um, and so this one was our first one. It's the one that I touches my heart the most. Mm. Uh, Camille was the lead actress in um, The Strength of Siblings, and she was amazing in that as well. So I'll turn it over to her. Yeah. So uh, Camille, had, so you, you've had prior acting experience? Um, I have. Uh, it's amazing. You, you're, you're so talented. I mean, you should act way better than I can. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It was uh, really tough to play those roles, hmm. especially because I related so much to some of the problems in the films, right. like uh, drug abuse, alcohol. I had a lot of family members who dealt with that, so it was kind of coming from my own personal place as well. Hmm. It was really a struggle to bring it out on camera yeah because it, it's kind of embarrassing to talk about to mm. let people know you deal with this kind of issue but it's mm -hmm. never dealt with mm. Mm. right i i you know i was once told you know if we can't if we can't name or speak our problems how can we ever you know move to uh, overcoming them so so, so to yeah. speak right so um so how i, I, I so I, I imagine like so the, the, the this film was made um, primarily for the other youth inside your tribe, right? Yeah. So, like, what what do you hope they get out of um, out of watching it? Um, for the adults and the youth, I sure mm -hmm. hope they understand the different perspectives. Um, you know, if you are the abuser mm. or not, to see both sides and to kind of understand more, because I feel like. You know, when you're upset, you only see one side of the story, not the other. Mm. So to get that real connection between the problems and hopefully understand and discuss it more. Mm. Makes sense. Um, Ian, I, I, I saw you had unmuted your, your, your mic. Did you also have an involvement inside, in, inside this film? Um, no, I was, uh, Beverly mentioned we were involved with a program now, those two or three weeks. Actually, it's been all summer. Just, I just wanted yeah. to throw that out there. <laughs> right, right. All. And Patricia is actually the, the lead on that. Also, I wanted to mention that Patricia is uh, very much the lead on everything we do here. I don't think I mentioned that earlier. Oh, uh, our festival, our labs, and she's actually busy right now working on something. That's why um, she assigned me to come here and do the speaking. So, right, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> amazing. Um, great, great to have there's you. one thing that I that I would like to say, and that was um, the idea for the film on teen suicide was really driven because a young person on the reservation had taken their life that mm. summer, and so it was a um, and and there were 15 youth that participated and they wrote the script it was their idea 
Wow. So they wrote the script, they performed in it, they directed and um, did the sound and all of that. Um, it was tough because they were dealing with grief of a, mm. um, you know, of a friend. And um, so for, for Mia or Camille to pull that off, uh, there were some, there were many moments that she had to take a break and, um, mm. and, and regroup. It was hard, very difficult for, for all of the kids, but uh, because she was playing that lead role, it was tougher on her. Mm. Mm. I, I, I mean, the part that really hit me the most was when Rachel sneaks into Adam's room and they go to sleep together. And I thought that was just such a beautiful moment that, you know, despite everything happening around them, despite all the negative, they still care and love for each other and find the support that they need. Um, thank you so much for doing this film. Uh, could, Camille, especially, what a great, what a great thing to, to, to have been a part of. I'm really looking forward to what your career is gonna be like in the future. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so moving on to uh, Bryson and Capico. Um, so I understand this, uh, this film was uh, made in part thanks to Sundance and their short program. Um, what an honor to have been part of that. I think uh, Sundance does a really great job at, uh, at um, ser servicing its uh, native constituents. Could you tell a little bit more, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about your experience in the lab and how, how they helped? Um, sure. Yeah, I, um, I, I wrote this script, um, it, it was really long, it used to be 30 pages, um, okay. and it was really funny at first, I know it doesn't <laughs> seem that way, but mm -hmm. I, I, it was a comedy in my head, um, and I, it, it was a film that I wanted to make, and um, all of the people that I really collaborated with, one day they all attended this workshop, um, not a workshop, but a, a panel that Bird Running Water did. Yeah. Um, he's the head of the Native program at Sundance. Perfect. And he was in Hawaii um, doing a panel and just talking about what kind of films they want to accept and what kind of films they want to, um, you know, involve in their program. Mm -hmm. And um, I wasn't able to attend this, but my collaborators came back and they're like, oh, dude, now this script that you wrote, it, it, we heard it from Bird, like it won't, it won't work for their mm -hmm. program and whatever. And I was like, well, I'll just throw it away. But I mean, why not just submit it anyway? And I ended up getting in. So they didn't know what they were talking about. And <laughs> it's like, that's the best way to succeed, I think, is like, in spite of um, right. all the haters. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but um, it was great. Uh, so it was a really unique um, Native Lab that they did. It was um, the first time that they hosted it in Hawaii, which was very cool. So um, in partnership with um, the Nichols, who are a, f a family, a couple here in Hawaii that are um, patrons of, of the arts here, they brought out the indigenous program. So Bird, um, and at the time, Adam, who's now taken a bigger role yeah. um, with Native Lab, and um, Maya at the time, I'm not sure if she's still there, but you know they all came and they uh -huh. brought mentors um, from their Native program, and uh -huh. we spent... Um, I don't remember how long, maybe a week or so, really working on our scripts. And um, I think I was really encouraged out of that lab to just make it. Mm. Um, and so I really kind of streamlined the process and we we made that film in maybe a month or so. So, I mean, with pre-production and everything, we really um, pushed through to make it. But um, their support was, was really instrumental to making it. And, um, it's been a few years actually since I made it and mm. we're still, I'm still screening it and I'm still talking about it. So I'm very grateful for that. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's so much to talk about with, with, with it. I mean, I think the thing that stuck out to me, I mean, um, I think oftentimes as Hawaiian men, as, as, as Kana, we don't get to see ourselves portrayed often in a very positive way where, you know, often, you know, overweight or dumb or just this caricature of hypermasculinity, right? So it's really rare we get to see Hawaiian men as emotional, as vulnerable, and ultimately as stewards of culture, right? So um, could, could you speak a little bit about where the idea for the film came from and um, what issues you're sort of aiming to talk about with it? 
Yeah, um, I think it, it's, it's kind of like Michelle's answer where we, we set out to tell one story and it, it ends up bringing in so many other things. But mm. what, what you spoke about is really what it was about for me. And it was about how we, I guess, express our nativeness in, mm. in, our, in our society today. And um, I think uh, the the protagonist, the the younger guy, um, Isaac, that uh, the actor's name is Isaac. Mm. He was really uh, the the handsomer version of of who I was at the time when I wrote it. And I was just thinking about what it meant to be native and how we how we act it out and how we portray it. And there's so many different ways. And I thought. Mm that Bruce, that the older guy um, and the younger character were kind of the duality of, of how we look at it as mm. somebody who's really in touch with their culture and, you know, is, um, speaks the language, knows their history and knows their omakua and all of their, you know, the, their spiritual, you know, um, aspects to it. Mm. And then like a very modern version of that and, mm. and what that looks like. And I think I, I can't talk about the film without talking about that we filmed it on Mauna Kea, which is now right. a site that's, you know, um, in contention and, it, it, you know, and when we filmed it, I don't want to say that there was nothing happening there because it, it was already, you know, there were things in motion and, and already there were protectors there yes. to, to, you know, to fight, but it wasn't what it became um, at the time. I mean, we just walked, we just drove up there and, and filmed it and we didn't ask permit, <laughs> permission or anything. We just went there. Right. And, you know, if we had waited a year or a year and a half later, there'd be, you know, thousands of people there protesting. And um, I think it was it was important and I think just sort of poignant to to bring that in that there is that aspect to it, too, about, mm. um, you know, at, we call it Aloha Aina, but, mm. you know, Hawaiians and their stewards of the land. And I think our connection to our land is not I mean, na natives get it right. I mean, we're not. We don't own it. We're we're here to protect it, and we're here to just make sure it it, it continues thriving for future generations. And um, I think that was something important too. But again, it was all these things that are ancillary ideas that, over time, I think, keep the film relevant. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I you kind of already answered. A Another question that, that that I had in terms of you know what it was like to go up there on on, on Mauna Kea. I mean, I think I think the protests up there had started in 2015, and this was filmed 2016. I'm assuming 2017. I, I don't remember. <laughs> That's so crazy, but yeah, I don't right. actually know. I, it was it definitely around the same time, but it the protests really reached their fever pitch. You know, the yeah. the the pinnacle maybe a year or so after the fact. So. Mm -hmm. The mm. film had kind of done its festival life mm. and was kind of having its second life um, right. when when the when the protests really made it to mainstream media and when you know Jason Momoa shows up, it, right. it becomes a, a big deal. Right, so. right, right. I mean, I was I was, was going to ask you, you know, what I mean. It's a, it's a very sacred place. I mean, I, I I've seen non-natives go up there and really feel something different. I mean, so what, what was it like to film in such a such an important site? It, it's actually crazy and um i i still go back to it every once in a while and i have this this instagram post i made years ago that we when we went up to scout it and we just didn't know if this would be something we even wanted to do you know it's it, it's it can be you know problematic to to film at a place like that mm -hmm. but we went there and it was sort of um you know the mana or the the sacred that power is like it's sort of palpable there and when you go there it like you can feel I, I know it's like I'm speaking in you know hyperbole or whatever but it, it actually does feel like you can feel a a connection to it and you know if like my my one sentence thing that doesn't do it justice is that's kind of our place of creation you know where we look at that's how that's where we come from you know like our um, Papa and Wakea, our, our mm. you know origin story comes from this spot, and I think it it is something tangible, whether it's on, mm. captured on film or not. I mean, I I don't know if that was our intention to get mm. it or not, and I'm I'm rambling about it, but it it was a very sacred space, and it 
it was weird shooting there and it, it, it is weird to go there no matter what in a good way and I mean it's and I'm glad that um we have something there on film and mm. I'm glad that that site became something so important in 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 the protesting and um yeah and that people are out there protecting it mm -hmm. trying to keep it the way we shot it mm. thank you yeah. Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much time here. So I would really like to open it up to the general Q and A. Um, so if you all have questions, I think Alex will invite you up and can ask your question. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, let's start by calling on Angelica Lopez. And just so that everyone knows, I'm going to welcome you over as a panelist and I'll switch this over to grid view and, um, and then I will uh, just to keep things flowing. I'll bring over the next person a little bit before um, the, the answer wraps up just so that we're ready to go. So just keep an eye on the chat and I'll put a running order of who we're gonna call on. So Angelica, I'm gonna move you over now. Okay, so Angelica, you just need to unmute yourself and turn on your video if you like. Hello. Hi. Perfect. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. Um, so I had asked earlier, thank you to the filmmakers, thank you to everybody for submitting for this awesome, just the series in the film, the festival, and I appreciate your work. I was emotional throughout the whole piece. Um, and I had had a question um, towards Escape and towards the filmmakers who were behind it. Um, I wanted to know what was the inspiration behind the docuseries style and what that was like and what the decision and creative decision behind it was. Um, I thought it was interesting and very, it was just a different take that I hadn't been brought on to as a journey. Um, so I wanted to kind of explore what that was like. Um. Oh, well, oh, did the filmmakers leave? No, 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 sorry, they're here. Um, Camille, sometimes I have to pin your video because your audio isn't uh, triggering the, the switch over, but let me do that now. Okay. I, well, um, I would say that uh, Kamea can probably answer that best because they, uh, uh, the youth really worked on, on the script, so. Um, it, it was kind of a struggle, the, the story process, uh, because there were so many different stories and everything. But as all the youth got together and we started talking, I feel like it kind of just fell into place. It was very emotional and rough to really talk about, especially with kids I don't know too well. I mean, I know of them. I just, I've never talked to them before. And the process of making it, I, I loved it personally. I was a lot closer with everybody there after we had filmed and talked, um, and I feel like I never got to know them in that way before. It was just a lot of emotion, <laughs> a lot yeah. of emotion. <laughs> and I, I think that's what I appreciated about it. I think the, um, the vulnerability just kind of cut to a talking head, quote unquote, right, of yeah. a character. Um, which I had a follow-up question to, to your role, um, being in that space as a docu-series, what were the challenges you felt um, playing in that style, like having to talk point blank to a camera? I'm not going to lie, it was very awkward. <laughs> it was really awkward to talk to a camera about those kinds of issues, because I always thought we were kind of going to do a goofy thing. I'm not upset that it was serious at all. I think that was the better approach, but it was the challenge of overcoming my fear because I always wanted to be behind the camera, never in front. 
but I think I enjoy being in front of the camera more. It mm. opens me up, kind of more open-minded. Um, and sheesh, I was so scared. <laughs> I still kind of am scared. I'm pretty <laughs> nervous, but I I don't regret it. Like, I'm very happy we talked about those kinds of things. It oh, seems yeah. to have made a change with a lot of people, not even just the tribe itself. I can attest to that. <laughs> it was, yeah, and I, I appreciate it. I think the 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 curation of the films back to back set me in a space, and I, I I'm I'm very honored to be welcomed into it and celebrate today. You know, for different voices and representation. So again, thanks to all the filmmakers and the writers and the creators, the visionists who are speaking today, because it's important. We need this now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Angelica. Um, I'm gonna move you back over and we have Liam ready to go. Hi, thank you all so much for coming here. I loved all of these films. Something I was wondering was what thoughts each of you might have on the issue of non-Native writers incorporating Native characters or Native themes into their work. I know it's a really contentious issue because there's such an awful history of misrepresentation in media. So I would love to hear what thoughts you have on if a more positive, a more authentic, a more ethical representation could be possible. What do you guys should take that or else I'm going to take it? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm not a script writer, but I'm non-native. <laughs> so um, I write a lot of uh, grant proposals for the tribe. And I guess over the, the past five years that I have written um, things for the tribe, what I find is that I say things differently. I mean things differently. They, they come out differently. And I think you need to ask a lot of questions and, and get to understand the culture. Um, I still make mistakes. Uh, but I remember in the beginning when I was writing grants for the tribe, I assumed I knew everything, you know, or I, I could say, well, what if we did it this way? Well, it's my way is completely different. And so I think listening to listening and understanding um, their culture and um, what's happened in their lives, listening is probably the, the, the number one thing. Uh, yeah, that's great, Bev. Um, you know, I'll if someone else wants to step in and like when the filmmakers would like to speak, I would I highly encourage that. But um, I'll just be honest. You know, um, it's really hard for American Indians, Alaskan Natives, or Native Hawaiians to get our voice out there and have the opportunity to write and uh, you know and get in front of uh, the people who make these decisions to create film and TV. Um, so what I you know what I really recommend is non-natives really need to take a step back and allow us our space so we can do that. Um, there's a lot of stories out there and there's been a lot of um, uh, misinterpretation and misrepresentation of, of, what, of how we wanna see ourselves. And we just rather not have non-natives do that, uh, just to be blunt. You know, we, we wanna do it ourselves and we want the space to be able to do it. Um, so while I, I'm not, while on one hand, I'm not discouraging you, uh, if you're talking about, you know, writing a script, you know, and having native themes and what have you, um, on the other hand, you know, um, we would prefer to just have our own selves do it and tell these stories, um, just because they belong to us, you know, so, and again, I encourage our filmmakers here to share their opinion on that, um, so please share your thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with Ian. I think that, you know, it's such, um, we, I think everyone kind of understands, you know, right? Like this is a school of cinema. You kind of understand the history, right? Of the erasure, the misrepresentation, the ugliness that came through in portraying indigenous people for the past hundred or so years 
and we can author our own narratives and we should be allowed that space to do so. And so I think, you know, what we do need though, are people to help uplift those voices and support them and promote them, but we can do it ourselves. Michelle Bryson, <laughs> would you like to add in on that? <laughs> would you like to weigh in on that? <laughs> I do agree with what everyone has said. It's we, it's our stories. And we're not, you know, trying not to discourage you. It's just we have had so much misrepresentation throughout cinema history. And so it's our time. And right now it's really hard for, you know, us to try to even get into these opportunities to tell these stories. So I think as an ally is to stand up for us and encourage us to do these stories. And like, if someone asks you, hey, can you ever see my script, like a native friend, give them words. But I think right now it's our time to tell our stories. And um, yeah, that's kind of my answer. Yeah, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just piggyback off of what everyone is saying. And I think, I think, um, it, as a non-native creative person, I think just really think about, you know, why it is you want to, you know, tell a native perspective or, or or have a native character, and and think about what function that that character fills in your story because we've seen them portrayed in all kinds of of ways, and um, Hawaii has its share of you know uh, Rob Schneider playing. A Hawaiian character, you know, fifty first dates kind of kind of thing, and um, I I think it it takes people like Ian and his initiatives to to kind of have a battering ram to to get us into <laughs> rooms with studio people, and it, you know, it's it's I I think there's a there are there is a lack of native stories, so it's great that people want to tell them, but it's not for lack of native writers and native filmmakers. It's just the lack of opportunity, I think. And so, um, you know, I, and maybe you're just thinking of like a, a side character or something like that. And I think to play devil's advocate and say, it, maybe it's okay, but think you have to just think about why, why you want that character and what type of role they're, they're filling in your story. But that's a great question. So thank, thanks for asking that. Um, does anyone else want to jump in or, uh, if not, I have Andy Cow coming over as a panelist. Oh, hi. Sorry for my background. <laughs> that was from a previous call. Um, I have a question. I was wondering, after watching the Escape film, um, I was inspired by this idea of collective filmmaking and a question for everyone is um, what are are there like more collective non hierarchical um, ways of filmmaking that y'all want to practice or already do practice and um, specifically for Camille I'm curious about how the collaboration was in decision making on making escape. Should, should I go first or? <laughs> um, so the collaboration, it was, I honestly think it was pretty simple because we, we did kind of have the same idea of, you know, serious issues. So to get together and to like collaborate on it was really easy. It was just really hard to explain it in the movie without it being so aggressive we didn't want it to come off as aggressive we just wanted more of an explanation um because i feel like explaining it is a lot better than kind of forcing the idea upon people because people won't want to understand it then so i think that's probably the best way we could have done it and it, it was a lot of fun though i mean i'd be happy to collaborate about more ideas like that like we did with the second film too um, and I mean, I think it was just really great because we're all so young, but we all understood it. Uh, 
Um, okay, I'm going to take a chance here with Anthony uh, because his uh, note was that he's also juggling putting his son to bed. So hopefully uh, we've, we've got him out there. Um, Anthony, if you're there, feel free to turn on your mic or your video. Hey there, guys. Sorry, uh, I stepped out for a little while. You may hear him in the background. I apologize. <laughs> I am a... Uh, I am Texas Indigenous Native, and I am actually a traditionally published author. Um, and my question was, I'm sorry, my question was, is there opportunity for Native people to tell stories or films in, um, in Hollywood right now? Or is it extremely difficult? And are there resources to help people with Native stories try to get recognized? Um, it is really difficult, <laughs> I'll say, um, but people like Ian and Patty, you know, is like a great example of, um, People are really, I think, you know, at the forefront of trying to not just bring in a, you know, and uplift Native filmmakers, but really pushing them out into, um, you know, Hollywood, like into their connections and they stay really, really connected. And I think, um, uh, what am I trying to say? They, um, they have different... Uh, labs that they do the film festival and I think it's just like you, they tap in to different organizations through that I, I, I don't want to you, you can speak about what you do but like it's just um, such a great uh, it creates a lot of great opportunities for native voices and we need more people like them um, but just to piggyback off what don't saying I think there, there are we do have more allies these days um, Dawn works with a uh, company called Topple, uh, which um, they've been an incredible support for our organization. And it's run by Joey Salloway. Um, Joey is the showrunner of um, Transparent, uh, but Joey also um, is working on um, many, many projects, you know, another with Dawn, and has been an incredible inspiration for a lot of our labs. Um, uh, Dawn, and just to go back to your point about uh, some um opportunities uh so uh so don was in our tv writers lab this past spring um looks like you have a lightsaber you should move out of the way that's pretty dangerous <laughs> so uh anyway yeah i'm sorry my son my son no, was loaded. No, i just again it's my a wife's a nurse please. so she's trying to sleep and uh i i got on this because um ian i think you may know uh my mm -hmm. friend uh rachel salinas with the intertribal council mm -hmm. of at t employees <laughs> I'm actually uh, her director of education and community engagement. So uh, she was like, you got to get on this. You got to try. Uh, she's also my cousin. And she's like, try to get on here. And so I'm trying to juggle being a dad and uh, and participating because I really was interested in seeing these films because you don't see a lot of them. Um, and um, I just wanted to to take a look at, at what, you know, what is out there. And, and they were amazing, the ones I got to see. And so I just want to say good job to everybody. And uh, and it may, it gives hope for people uh, with native backgrounds who feel like they, no matter how hard you try or what you do, it's it's kind of hard to to break through that next level. And um, I know a lot of people give up. And so I just wanted to uh, to thank y'all and and um, to listen to y'all's journeys and see how they parallel with uh, with what a lot of native uh, creative people are going through right now. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I saw you on Facebook there. So thanks again for for your support and being here. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the time. Um, so I, I think this is a really nice moment for us to uh, thank you all and to, to wish everyone well. And if we can bring Stacy back, we'll get the full Brady Bunch, you know, nine, nine video panels. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> thank you all so much. This was incredibly special. 
Um, I, I'm just so moved by the stories that you're telling. Uh, Capenna, you were absolutely magnificent tonight. Um, thank you, Stacy, for a beautiful introduction. Ian, I can't wait to work with you guys again next week. Um, I, I really hope that, um, uh, that everyone that's out there will join us again. We'll put something out very soon about it. Mm -hmm. And I can't wait to see what all of you do next. I hope that you know when the when the time is right, maybe we can have you come and present it on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, happy, happy Indigenous Peoples Day, everyone! Yeah. <laughs> what a great way to celebrate. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you, Kapena. Thank you, Stacy. Really appreciate your time and and your partnership. On that note, I hope everyone stays safe and uh, continues to spread the gospel of cinema. Um, and I look forward to the next time we get to meet again. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Thank you take care.